Hello, everybody. Good to see your faces. You too. So good to see you. So we're still getting people coming in, but since we're virtual, we wanted to start everyone off with a little poll just to get engaged and start thinking about tonight's topic, which is youth behavior health. So I have entered the poll into the chat, uh, but just to read it aloud for everyone, um, just so you know, all of your responses are anonymous. Um, so we're just curious as to what types of interactions do you have with youth in your job or your life? Uh, so either direct, such as counseling, teaching, parenting, mentoring, therapy, et cetera, or indirect, policymaking, resource allocation, uh, or both, or if that is not applicable. And welcome everyone as you're coming on. We have entered a poll in the chat. So I will give everyone some time to respond to the poll, um, but thank you all for joining tonight. I know we still have some people coming in. Uh, tonight's topic for the Prince George's Healthcare Action Coalition quarterly meeting is supporting growing minds. So we'll be focusing on youth programs and data related to uh, mental health and substance misuse. So to quickly walk us through our agenda, We'll start off with a welcome. Uh, we have our welcome poll in the chat for those who haven't seen it. We'll be introducing the Maryland Consortium on Coordinated Community Supports awardees. Then we'll go over to some youth mental health data and substance use data review. And next we'll have a presentation on some two new SAMHSA grant awards. And then finally, we will close out with the Prince George's Healthcare Actual Coalition workgroup updates. So as you're joining, please feel free to complete the welcome poll and introduce yourself in the chat with your name and your organization. All right, I know we still have some people coming in. Um, Dr. Levy, I just wanted to check in to see how your connectivity is going. Going OK? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Um, I got it working. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, and Kim, thank you for, for putting this all together. Uh, I know this is a lot of work and and I think and I and I want to thank everybody on the call for giving up their dinner time to to be here. Um, I, I look at this group as a very important group in general um, because and, and specifically really to try to give us give us a set point and sort of understand what's happening in the community and also to provide information to you. Oh, okay. Wait a minute. My so started. with that. Without further ado, um, we are want to just present these slides really quickly. The, uh, the Maryland Consortium on Com Coordinated Community Support. Next slide. So we, um, the the consortium uh, support is, is 25 new 25 members, and they're responsible for expanding access to behavioral services for students 
part of the, the blueprint for Maryland's future. And we, um, next slide. We, uh, they were, they put out essentially an RFP for, for, for $111 million of new grant money to support health, mental health, particularly in schools. And the goal was to expand access to high quality behavioral health services, improve student well being, uh, foster positive classroom, and sustain, uh, promote sustainability through Medicaid billing and revenue and commercial. Um, and we, next slide. Um, and, and we really uh, tried very hard to engage our community, community partners, uh, the Office of Community. The, the Office of County Executive and the Health Department and the LBHA really uh, tried to reach out and have multiple sessions with our uh, community partners to to do Q Q and A and also answer que answer questions and also support with letters and 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 uh, through the application process so that we ended up next slide we ended up uh, supporting. 55 applications. I, I don't know the exact number, but we were well ahead of everybody else in our application process, and we were so excited to support the many. We were hoping we'd get all 55, but you know that was a that was a little bit of a, a pie in the sky. Uh, but what we ended up doing is getting is actually 19 of our uh, community partners in behavioral health uh, were awarded. Uh, up to to the amount of twenty, I think it's twenty four point five million dollars, twenty four point nine million dollars, which, as you can see, is double Baltimore City and 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 way way higher than anybody else. So, uh, congratulations to the nineteen, um, and and we are so excited that you are going to be serving the the, the students in the schools. Um, anything we can do to help, we are going to be reaching out. These are all the 19 organizations. I think probably some of you are on the call today, um, and we're we're thrilled. And we are gonna we're gonna uh, set up a meeting to sort of talk about how we, as the health department, can support you. These were considered hubs. I'm sorry, spokes in the hubs, hope and ho, hub and spoke model, um, and. Uh, we unfortunately, the, the health department did not get funded as a hub. That all being said, we, while the money was important, supporting you is equally as important. And we're going to try to find ways to support you uh, in your work uh, for the next year when they come out with another RFP. They had 17 organizations apply, and they, they only supported 10. So in the future, we are going to be applying again when it comes out. But in the meantime, we want to meet with you. We want to understand what your needs are, see how we can support you with the current resources that we have, and think about what we need to do in the future. So we're not just dropping the ball on this. We want to be a partner with you. We plan on being a partner with you. And congratulations. We're excited about this and uh, look forward to working with you all. Any questions? For, for those on the call uh, who are funded, can you just do a thumbs up? I want to see how many folks we got. I don't see that many, but that's okay. Um, well, congratulations to those who are the 19 who were awarded. And uh, if you didn't get awarded, there's there's going to be I'm sure there's going to be another round and we will support you in that as well. So. Uh, back to you, Kim. Thank you so much. I wanted to and say that feels like the news, you know, like news reporter back to you, Kim. I love it. <laughs> And just so you know, we have the consortium website in the chat as well as the if you want to be added to the mailing list um, to get more information about those grants and um, other opportunities that may come up. 
So next, I would like to go ahead and move us forward to our next part of the meeting, which is sharing trends from the 2018 to 2021 YRBS and state level data. Uh, we have Ms. Taylor Palmer here to present. Uh, she is a health policy analyst with the health department uh, and offers great support for the coalition. Um, and so I will hand it over to Taylor. Thank you so much. Thank you for kicking it over to me, Kim. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. As Kim mentioned, I will be presenting on the Maryland Youth Risk Behavior Survey results uh, comparing the 2018 to 2021 data, as well as doing a comparison uh, with Prince George's County level data and Maryland level data. Um, before we get started, I do want to give a massive round of kudos to Deborah and Cameron from our team, uh, the Office of Assessment and Planning and the Health Department for all of their work to put this together. It wouldn't have been possible without them. So thank you very much for all of your work on this. Um, and again, before we get started, um, tonight's presentation is going to contain um, information about su suicide ideation and depression. So please do make sure you are taking good care of yourself during this presentation and after this presentation. Um, please continue to take breaks, go off camera, step away from your laptop. It's a beautiful day outside if you need to step out for a moment um, and do seek any support afterwards as needed. All right, so to get us started, we are going to first look at the middle school respondents uh, for the YRBS data tonight. So for your reference for the next several slides, uh, here are the demographics of the middle school respondents that we will be referencing and talking more about their responses this evening. And kicking it into our first question from the YRBS, uh, this first question has to do with feelings of sadness or hopelessness almost every day for two weeks or more in a row that stopped middle school students from doing their usual activities. Um, so as we can see here across all grade levels, um, there was a significant increase uh, from in 2021 compared to 2018. Um, and that's illustrated in that blue bar compared to the gray. And looking over on our left hand side, looking to compare Prince George's County level data compared to Maryland data, uh, we do see that Prince George's County uh, middle school students are responding to this occurrence uh, more likely than Maryland students, Maryland middle school students, that is. Um, you can see. Um, Almost, we're edging at almost half of students uh, at the eighth grade level, for example, are experiencing uh, sadness or hopeless, prolonged sadness or hopelessness that is keeping them from doing usual activities. So you can see that breakdown a little bit closer. But again, looking at trends, we are seeing a higher rate of Prince George's County versus Maryland middle school students. Um, if you look over to the other side of this slide, you can see our breakdown of self-identifying male versus females, uh, focusing specifically on 2021 YRBS data. So here, uh, illustrated by our green line, you can see our self-identifying males, and that gray line above uh, is the self-identifying females. Um, you can see females at every grade level are responding to uh, feelings, prolonged feelings of sadness and hopelessness um, that is keeping them from doing their usual activities more often than self-identifying males, um, especially it's especially noticeable at that eighth grade level um, when we're seeing um, double the amount of uh, self-identifying females are reporting this uh, compared to their eighth grade self-identifying male counterparts. And uh, going next to our next question from the YRBS. So the next question is, have you ever made a plan about how you would kill yourself? Um, we do want to pinpoint um, just looking at language with the YRBS uh, at the middle school level. When asking this question, they do use terms like kill yourself versus suicide. Um, so that's an important indication that we just want to uh, call out there. Um, so again, if we're looking at this blue bar here, we're looking at the 2021 data. We are looking at um, increases across all grade levels 
uh, compared to the 2018. We're looking at those differences and we're seeing that steady increase from sixth to eighth grade um, where we're entering almost one in third, one in three eighth grade students um, have made a plan, have indicated that they've ever made a plan about killing themselves. Um, and again, looking at these line graphs here, you can see our comparison, Prince George's County versus Maryland level data. We're looking at that blue line for Prince George's County, um, and we're seeing that um, the, the uh, numbers are higher than at the Maryland level, than Maryland middle schoolers. Um, we're seeing that difference across all grade levels. And again, we're seeing that uh, steady increase. Again, um, almost one third of eighth graders are responding having ever made a plan to kill themselves. And over on the other side here, we can see self-identifying males versus females. Looking at the 2021 data specifically, um, we can see that for both seventh and eighth graders, um, self-identifying females were twice as likely to respond having made a plan to kill themselves ever in their lifetime compared to their self-identifying male counterparts. So definitely gives us impetus to the work that we are doing and some critical insights as to what comes next. Um, this leads us to our next question here um, from the YRBS. Um, this question for middle schoolers, have you ever tried to kill yourself? Um, again, we're looking at that blue bar. We're seeing increases in 2021 from 2018 for sixth and seventh graders. Um, we are seeing that little decrease there uh, for eighth graders. And again, this is, although we do see um, that decrease there for the eighth graders, it is really important to note, I wanna bring out that comparison compared to Maryland level data, uh, Prince George's County is certainly still more elevated than uh, Maryland middle schoolers in terms of um, attempts to kill themselves. Um, and looking over to our self-identifying males versus females, again, we're seeing those differences. Um, and if we look to the eighth graders, we're seeing that self-identifying females, uh, middle school students are th more than three times as likely than their self-identifying male counterparts to have uh, reported um, trying to kill themselves ever in their lifetime. So all of this is, of course, so very significant. Um, we in the Behavioral Health Advisory Group, we're looking at this Healthy People 2030 goal. This is so significant at both the county level and the state level, um, looking at that Healthy People 2030 goal to reduce suicide attempts by adolescents to 1.8%. So I really want to make that clear. Um, if we're looking at our graph here, comparing Prince George's County level data to Maryland level data, um, there is work both at the county and the state level. It requires us all. Um, and you can see that both the county and the state, we are completely off of that mark. And there is a lot of work that needs to be done uh, for middle school students. And especially if we're looking across, um, of course, if we're looking at self-identifying males and females as well, looking across the gender binary. And we can go to the next slide, please. All right, and we are going to next transition to our high school respondents. So again, for your reference, here are the demographics of the high school respondents to the YRBS in Prince George's County that we will be referencing for the next several slides. And again, we can see um, from our comparison to middle school students for the same question um, of note, the language here is a little bit different uh, for high school students, so that's ninth through 12th graders, we are going to be using language that asks about the past 12 months. So in the past 12 months, we can see that at every grade level, ninth through 12th, that students uh, experienced uh, feelings of sadness or hopelessness um, more than they did at um, that 2018, um, at that 2018 data point. So we're seeing those increases at every grade level uh, in 2021 compared to our 2018 data. Um, and same as we saw with the uh, middle school students, high school students um, are also experiencing this prolonged uh, feeling of sadness 
and hopelessness that have stopped them from doing their usual activities um, at higher rates than Maryland high school students are reporting uh, across every grade level. You can see that our blue line here for Prince George's County is um, much above the Maryland level or Maryland high school students. Um, and then again, over here, we can look to our self-identifying males versus females in 2021. Um, this one here is interesting. We're seeing that uh, starting at that ninth grade level, we're seeing that over half of self-identifying females in ninth grade were, res um, were reporting this periodic uh, sadness and hopelessness. Um, and we can see um, as the grade level increases, we can see that start to steadily go down. Um, whereas with the males, we're seeing that it is, um, we're having that steady increase, um, ending up at 38.6%. So this, again, gives us some more attention to pay to um, and taking a look at this prolonged sadness and help, hopelessness um, that is impacting uh, students from completing their usual activities. And that leads us to our next question here. Um, again, during the past 12 months, um, did high school students make a plan on how they would attempt suicide? Again, a little bit of different language here coming from the YRBS. Um, although we are seeing that the data here is um, compared, uh, except for a ninth grade level for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders, we are seeing a decrease um, at in 2021 compared to our 2018 uh, level data, but at ninth grade, we are seeing an increase there um, that can show us some the need for early prevention and to look a little dip, bit deeper, deeper into what's happening there at ninth grade. But um, although we are seeing um, this decrease from 2018 to 2021 for 10th through 12th graders, we can look at the next slide. And we can see, um, again, that is remaining consistent with um, Maryland level data for the most part, um, we can see that um, for 10th grade, we're under that Maryland level um, as well for 12th graders, but uh, for 9th and 11th graders, Prince George's County high school students are reporting at higher rates than uh, Maryland level uh, high school students for having reported made a, uh, making a plan on how they may kill themselves in the past 12 months. Um, if we look over again to our self-identifying males versus females in 2021, uh, we see that my, my eyesight immediately goes to that ninth grade. Um, there in the beginning, we're looking at 31.9% uh, compared to 8.2%. Um, over three times as likely uh, females are self-identifying females are compared to their uh, male counterparts in the ninth grade to have made a plan on how they would attempt suicide in the past 12 months. Um, and across all grade levels, we can see that females, self-identifying females are reporting um, higher. They are more likely to have made a plan about how they would attempt suicide than their male counterparts. And for this, um, we wanted to break it down. Um, so what you just saw had to do with gender. So we saw our male versus females for high school students and being able to look at those differences uh, in the data for um, high school students who have made a plan about how they would commit suicide in the past 12 months. Um, for um, From YRBS, we have the unique opportunity to also look at sexual orientation for high school students specifically. Um, so they do have this demographic included and something that we can uh, look further into um, for the questions regarding high school students specifically on the YRBS. Um, so again, um, coming from that last slide, we're seeing that um, self-identifying females are reporting um, higher a higher likelihood of um, having made a plan about how they would attempt suicide in the past 12 months compared to their self-identifying male counterparts. But then as we break it down by sexual orientation, uh, we're looking at these categories from the YRBS, heterosexual or straight students um, who identify, we're seeing 11.1% of those students have um, uh, indicated that they have made um, a plan on how they would commit suicide in the past 12 months. Um, and if we compare that to their uh, self-identifying gay, lesbian, or bisexual, as well as their other or questioning um, counterparts, 
we see that almost three times as likely are uh, gay, lesbian, or bisexual uh, high school students and other questioning students. So um, again, this graph is showing total students. Um, we're not looking at it by grade, um, but again, we are seeing that um, students who identify as gay, lesbian, or bisexual and other in questioning are um, more likely to report having made a plan about how to attempt suicide in the past 12 months than their self-identifying heterosexual or straight counterparts. And that leads us to our next question here. Uh, during the past 12 months, uh, the YRBS asks high school students um, how many times they actually attempted suicide. So here on this graph, you can see the percentage of high school students who reported one or more suicide attempts in the last 12 months. Uh, this is our comparison, Prince George's County level data compared to Maryland data. Um, as you can see, our percentages are way off from that 1.8%. Um, way off from that 1.8% of the Healthy People 2030 goal. So this really um, gives us something to work towards um, and something that we need to gear our work towards and um, answer this call for youth behavioral health. So um, we certainly hope to see that decline and approach that 1.8% from where it is now. Um, and then this graph here, we have a little bit more of a breakdown. Um, Again, this question asks specifically about how many times did students actually attempt suicide? Um, so we did want to give this visualization to break it down to uh, from one time or two or more times. So in the darker blue, um, that is the percentage of students, of high school students who have um, attempted suicide one time during the last 12 months. Um, broken down by grade level, and then there in the lighter blue, you can see uh, two or more suicide attempts in the last 12 months by high school students broken down at each grade level. So as you can see, um, this is extremely problematic, but especially for those ninth and 10th graders, um, if you're noticing that uh, 5.1 and that 4.1% for that lighter blue um, certainly gives room for uh, early prevention and prevention overall across every grade level for high school students and middle school students. And uh, this question we were also able to break down to look at uh, gender and sexual orientation. So again, uh, self-identifying female students uh, are more likely to um, have attempted suicide in the past 12 months. Um, and then if we jump over to sexual orientation here, uh, starting with our first bar, I see that 15.2% of uh, um, self-identifying heterosexual or straight high school students have attempted suicide in the last year. Um, and we can see that increase. Um, it increases for across gay, lesbian, or bisexual students, as well as self-identifying other questioning students. And um, again, we want to look at behavioral health as a whole. We want to be able to look at um, some of the um, some of the things that may be going on in a student's social life and start to look at some other factors um, and trying to increase overall mental and physical health. So if we are looking at this substance use data here, um, this is an important graph to notice that at the sixth and seventh grade level, um, Prince George's County is remaining consistent with Maryland level data um, for sixth and seventh graders who report marijuana use. This is again, uh, ever in their lifetime. So who have ever used marijuana, but at that eighth grade level, that's where we're seeing um, the increase, that stark increase at 14.4% compared to 8.8. .8. Um, so that could very well be an area where we focus some prevention on and see where um, students are beginning to um, have that early exposure to marijuana in Prince George's County compared to Maryland. Um, let's see here. And then for this graph here, we have our um, high school level respondents. So uh, broken down at each grade level, um, this question asked students during the past 30 days, um, how many times have you used marijuana? So this graph is showing high school students who reported marijuana use um, more than one time in the last 30 days. Um, so you can see here, again, Prince George's County is 
pretty consistent with um, Maryland high school students. Um, and we're seeing that increase um, from ninth to 12th grade um, with 12th graders being elevated from Maryland as well as at the 10th grade level um, when comparing Prince George's County students compared to Maryland students. Um, for our substance use questions, this was another question that we wanted to ask about prescription pain medication uh, misuse. So this question asks um, six through 12th graders, uh, middle school and high school students, um, if they have ever taken prescription pain medication without a doctor's prescription or differently than how the doctor told them to use it. And so here we have our comparison 2018 to 2021. Again, if we're focusing on that blue, if we're focusing on that blue bar there, we're seeing increases at 2021 compared to our 2018 um, across majority of the grade levels um, other than that 10th grade level um, showing an increased um, an increased incurrence of this prescription drug misuse. And so again, um, this is a comparison uh, for middle schoolers and high school students um, for in Prince George's County versus Maryland middle schoolers and high schoolers. Um, so again, we're seeing that starting at sixth grade, if we look at that difference there, 13.3% versus 9.9%, um, we are seeing that Prince George's County uh, middle schoolers, especially at that sixth grade level, are having um, they're having younger exposure to um, prescription pain medication misuse than Maryland uh, youth. So that brings that brings um, that bring that brings us back to our work and um, certainly taking a closer look at these um, the elevated occurrence in Prince George's County um, for both middle schoolers and high school students um, if we're looking at prescription pain medication misuse um, and seeing overall that um, earlier exposure to substances. And that wraps up um, just a quick overview of the mental health and substance use occurrences um, across Prince George's County compared to 2018, as well as the at the Maryland level. Um, again, these topics are very unsettling. Um, so please do make sure you are continuing to check in on yourself, those around you. Um, if you need help, please do reach out, um, putting this information here up on the screen uh, to contact 988. Um, if you are ever need in need of support or if those around you are in support. Um, I thank you all for your attention um, and for your work. Um, there's, as you can see, there's much, much to improve on. Um, but my hope and optimism is the Behavioral Health Advisory Group, um, putting a plug in for that group. Um, if individuals are encouraged to expand this work, get in this work after this call, uh, please do think about joining the BHAG. Um, the next meeting is next Wednesday. We'll put more information at the end, but we could certainly benefit from your support and seeing um, what we can do to improve the mental health and substance use of middle schoolers and high school students in Prince George's County. Thank you all. Thank you, Taylor. Um, I uh, really appreciate you sharing that data. I know how extremely tough it is to share that story. Um, so, so thank you. I appreciate the time that you spent pulling that together. Um, everyone, please take a deep breath uh, because that is very heavy information. But as Taylor mentioned um, and Dr. Levy mentioned, hopefully we can utilize the $25 million of funding that came to the, the county to really focus on those issues and um, all of our other initiatives. And I'm I'm looking forward to hearing from some of the, the grant funding that is recently received from SAMHSA to, to help us um, take some steps in that direction. So we can go ahead and open to any questions, any initial questions um, at this time around the data. And we also have shared a link to the um, the Maryland YRBS main page. So you can go back to that as well.
Hello, anyone asking questions yet? Not yet. Are you uh, our first? Hi, I'm sure I'm not. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Hello. I'm Cheryl Maxwell with the Black Mental Health Alliance. And we certainly have been doing a lot of work in Annapolis around the 988 uh, behavioral health crisis hotline. So uh, I saw that it was referred to in the presentation as the suicide. Um, uh, uh, Let's see, this, uh, the suicide and crisis lifeline. Um, I don't want there to be confusion around that. Uh, yes, suicide is crisis and behavioral health, mental health, uh, there are crises. Uh, we wouldn't want anyone looking at that to think that, oh, if somebody is having mood swings, which is an indication of a mental health issue, that this would not be the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the hotline or the crisis number to call. So just so that we don't have people thinking that there's more than one or two of these things converging, uh, the 988 is for behavioral health crises, period. Whether it's suicide, whether it's depression, whether it happens to be uh, bipolarism, so that all of that is responded to by those mental health professionals who are there at those call centers to respond. Thank you for making that clarification and um, making sure that everyone is aware of those resources at, at, across the board. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Okay, we can go ahead and move forward. And if you digest the information a little bit and have any questions as follow up, feel Feel free to put them in the chat and we can um, respond to them or follow up later. All right, so as a follow up, uh, we would like to introduce Ms. Brittany Vasquez, a uh, certified forensic social worker and program manager with the Prince George's County Health Department. Uh, Brittany will be presenting on the Healthy Transitions Grant and the System of Care Grant. So thank you so much, Brittany, for joining today, and I, you have the floor. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, so again, my name is Brittany Vasquez. I'm the, um, I am the Program Manager for Grants and Special Projects at the Behavioral Health Services Division. And we were recently um, awarded two SAMHSA grants. One is the System of Care or SOC grant. Um, that one targets children and their families. And then we were also awarded the Healthy Transitions grant, which targets our transition aged youth um, ages 16 to 25. So the System of Care grant is was awarded on September 30th of 2023 and will go until September 29th, 2027. The Healthy Transitions grant is a five-year grant from September 2023 to September 2028. So a system of care is a spectrum of effective community-based services and supports for children and youth with or at risk for mental health or other challenges, as well as their families who also need that support. Um, it's organized into a coordinated network. It builds meaningful partnerships with family and youth and addresses their cultural and linguistic needs in order to help them to function better at home, in school, in the community, and throughout life. So this is just a map showing the systems of care that we have across the US and territories. And you could see that there is clearly a lot, you know, more work to be done. There's a lot of empty spaces there. So a system of care is not an exact model to be replicated. It's not a single program, but it's a coordinating network of services across multiple agencies. So everyone coming together to make sure that the child or the family is supported in all the areas that they need support. So it's not a treatment or clinical intervention that directly improves child and family outcomes, 
without accompanying changes at the practice level to provide effective services and supports to achieve positive family um, and child outcomes. So the whole model is really just focused on the child and the family and making sure that they have all the services that they need, all the supports that are surrounding them, the wraparound services. Um, the system of care is designed to ensure availability of and access to a broad, flexible array of effective, evidence-informed community-based services and supports for children and their families that address their physical, emotional, social, and educational needs. So everything that would be affecting them or influencing them. So the system of care grant, the award was $4 million over the course of four years. And our goal is to serve at least 350 children ages birth through 21 who are at risk for or who have serious emotional disturbances and are at risk of entering the foster care system and potentially the juvenile justice system as well, and also to support their families. Um, the Healthy Transition Grant, again, is a five-year grant. We were awarded $3,750,000 over that course of the five years. Um, and our goal is to serve at least 275 transition-aged youth and young adults aged 16 to 25, um, with a focus on those who are aging out of foster care and leaving the juvenile justice system. So some of our partners, our University of Maryland, Baltimore, they're our evaluation team, collecting the data and reporting on it. Synergy Family Services and Maryland Family Resource Center are our outpatient clinics, um, providing behavioral health services to the target population. NAMI of Prince George's County um, provides peer-led groups and peer-led services um, to the family members and caregivers of these children who have these behavioral health needs. And Maryland Coalition of Families has a lead family coordinator to ensure a smooth operation of referral pathways to the entire co continuum of existing SOC services. Um, and they also have peer support and advocacy services. So the whole system of care model is really utilizing the collective impact model where we're outsourcing all of the services to have them um, to have them facilitated by agencies that are already in the community serving these populations. And then from the health department, we'll have a project director who will oversee the entire program. So our first goal under the SOC grant is to enact a local health care, um, local health care policies that mean mandate children, youth and family guided input, service integration and coordination, cultural and linguistic responsiveness to improve accessibility and availability of behavioral health care for the target population. Our second goal is to develop and implement community-wide social marketing education and messaging to reduce stigma about seeking and receiving mental health treatment and or co-occurring SUD or substance use disorder. And then our third goal is to increase the competency and capacity of local behavioral health, physical health, education, and social service providers to deliver programming that addresses the needs of the target population. Our fourth goal is to increase children, youth, and family representation and input on the design, development, and implementation of services that target them. So through these partnerships, the SOC will leverage our school-based pediatric telehealth network, 
and expand access, advocate for increased funding to cover health care costs, and deliver training and technical assistance to primary care physicians, including pedi pediatricians to raise awareness of the necessity to assess substance use history, trauma history, risk for suicide, and general health conditions as part of the routine care of children and youth. So the proposed SOC will establish a mental health access and primary care practice program, um, provide training and technical assistance to local pediatricians and primary care physicians on how to incorporate behavioral health assessments as part of routine care. Um, in consultation with the SOC core team, we'll also explore promoting the adoption of standardized behavioral health screening tools um, to better um, that these providers could use during their well visits and countywide adoption of a single tool or set of tools would facilitate population health management of the target population and improve the quality of data available on the, in, on the incidence and prevalence of various conditions and their treatment outcomes. Our fifth goal in the SOC grant is to increase partnering behavioral health providers capacity to serve children ages zero to six who are at risk for or who have um, serious emotional disturbances as well as their families through the implementation of an early childhood evidence based practice. So moving over to the Healthy Transition Grant that targets our 16 to 25 year olds in the county, um, this award will provide important resources to expand and develop, um, to expand access to developmentally cultural and, and linguistically appropriate services and supports for at least 275 transition aged youth and young adults who have or are at risk for developing severe mental health conditions. So some of the partners overlap with the SOC partners. Um, we are again utilizing the um, collective impact model. We have University of Maryland Baltimore, who's our evaluation team. Um, Maryland Family Resource and iMind will actually be the two outpatient um, behavioral health service providers for this particular grant. Um, and this will really support us in making less barriers in the transition between the pediatric system and the adult health care system. Um, and then Maryland Coalition of Families will have a youth coordinator and provide youth leadership and educational enrichment activities. Um, they'll also co-chair the establishment of a Prince George's County Taking Flight program, which trains youth age 18 to 26 to use personal experience with behavioral health challenges and trauma to advocate for positive system changes. And then we have hired a um, project director for the Healthy Transitions Grant who will be overseeing the entire project. So our first goal for Healthy Transitions is to expand and increase access, access to TAY treatment, recovery and support services, including strengthening evidence-based practices that will address all life domains for the population of focus. Our second goal is to increase the self-efficiency and meaningful participation in transition plans of transition-aged youth who have mental health and or co-occurring substance use disorder. So the Healthy Transition Grant really, we're really looking for transition-aged youth to have a voice in their um, treatment planning, as well as a voice in advocacy and policy to better help this age group in our community and make sure they're getting the supports and services they need. 
Our third goal is to increase community buy-in and responsiveness to transition-aged youth service needs and outcomes. Our fourth goal is to develop and implement countywide social marketing and education messaging to reduce stigma about getting help for mental health and or co-occurring substance use disorder. Reducing stigma is definitely a big, um, is really a target of ours with this. And also making sure that the transition aged youth are being heard and being seen in our social marketing. Um, and that they have a voice in it. So over the course of the next um, five years, we hope to reach 275 um, transition aged youth. And then for um, both of these grants, these are just the points of contact. My information is there. Um, if anyone has any questions or comments that they would like to reach out to me about, after this presentation, you could feel free to email me with any comments and questions. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? Um, This is a quiet group tonight. <laughs> have to get you all back in person. Brittany, in terms of, and forgive me if I missed it during the flipping, um, in terms of like a referral process for any of these programs, um, how can, we share that better with the group. I'm sure it'll will there'll be chance opportunities to share it with the BHAG uh, coalition group. But mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, and actually, thank you for bringing that up because I did forget to mention that implementation of both of these programs is going to start on March 30th. So on March 30th, our providers will be ready to take referrals. Um, we are finalizing our referral form, um, which will be available on the health department's website under the step forward um, tab. When you go on that website, there will be a QR code and a link so that you could fill it out. Um, it will also be on all of our partners' websites as well. Um, and anyone can fill it out. Um, our main referral pathways are going to be from DSS and DJS, but people could self-refer. You could refer for someone else. Um, so anyone can access it through the website. And we will have that up by the 30th so that we could start taking referrals. Great. Thank you. Welcome. And thank we can you. certainly distribute that through the um, the coalition's newsletter and and the BHAG group. Yes, that would be great. Right, any additional questions? Okay, we will be sure to share the slides with Brittany's information. Thank you so much for sharing this um, and I look forward to hearing how these go. Thank you. Okay, so next on the agenda tonight, we'll just be uh, giving a brief update from all, each of our work groups. Um, so as you all know, I know most of you here participate in one of our one or more of our coalition work groups. We have four uh, right now. We are in the process of finish putting the finishing touches on our community health improvement plan. So as soon as that is ready, we will distributed out to the group to review. Uh, but we just wanted to share a couple of the highlights, um, each, our goals for each of the work groups and some of the work that has been done so far this quarter. So starting with the health equity work group, uh, the goal for our health equity work group are to advocate for the implementation of health and all policies. And then our second goal is to enhance the accessibility and inclusivity of public health messaging across communities 
of diverse cultures, socioeconomic backgrounds, languages, and geographic locations. Our co-chairs for the health equity work groupers are Cesar Kaod and Christine Stewart, and they meet every, thir every third Thursday at 3 p.m. So we um, welcome anyone that would like to be a part of this group and join us for this uh, for these goals. Um, so far this quarter, we have been focusing on the development of learning objectives for a health equity champions program. And the purpose of this health equity champions program is to promote health in all policies and to build a community of members who can speak to health in all policies and really um, stand up for health in all policies and health equity uh, in, in policy or any processes throughout the county. This group has also engaged with the University of Maryland Consumer Health Information Hub to get information on resources from the health literacy on health literacy. Um, I believe I did see Dr. Jackson on tonight, um, and they they have a wealth of information in terms of um, just what what can you do to update your website to make sure it abides by the rules of health literacy and and that it's accessible to more people. So we will look forward to sharing those um, tools on our website in the future. Moving on to the behavioral health advisory group. We have three goals with that group uh, to promote the upstream behavioral health care to prevent the onset of crisis, integrate programs and services in the continuum of care for high risk individuals and social support networks, and to destigmatize, destigmatize the utilization of behavioral health services. So very much in line with the two SAMHSA grants that we just heard about. And our co-chairs for this group are Nina Ward from Prince George's Health Department and from TLC Maryland, Margaret Fowler and Carlos McCall. And I know I saw at least Nina on tonight. So hi, Nina. Uh, in terms of quarterly updates for this group, they've been working hard, um, as we talked about in the beginning of this meeting, to promote the Maryland Consortium on Coordinated Supports grant opportunity. And then we've also they've also engaged with community based organizations that represent different sectors of the behavioral health continuum. So they share a lot of um, information about services that are available throughout the county and are exploring uh, ways to connect people with resources before they get to that uh, crisis. This group meets the third Wednesday at 3 p.m. Um, so again, if you can fill out that uh, the form that is in the chat, if you would like to join. Our next group is the Healthy Eating Active Living Work Group, and their two goals are to improve the health and wellness of individuals with chronic conditions uh, by providing access to nutritious foods and chronic conditions. They're specifically focused on obesity and uh, metabolic syndrome. And then their next goal is to promote healthy eating and active living in county policy and zoning. So this goal is very much focused around our healthy food priority areas map. The co-chairs are Anthony Nolan and Jessica Moyes. Anthony's from the uh, Maryland National Capital Parks and Planning Commission and Jessica's from the American Heart Association. In terms of their quarterly updates, they have been exploring new opportunities for food as medicine grants. Um, as some of you may know, this group completed a pilot program for food as medicine this year or in 2023. And they're looking for something to do as a follow up to that. It was really great work. They had some um, positive findings in the six months of participation for all of their, uh, I think, 80 participants. So they want to see where they can take that next. And then um, we, for the healthy food priority areas, they've completed a review of the food facility designation methodology. Uh, we're working on uh, updating that map for version two so that we have updated census data, but also have the most updated uh, food facility available in the map. And they're also exploring some new, uh, just adding a layer in the map for, um, food distribution sites and uh, farmers markets. So we have representation of those as well. This group meets every other month, the first Wednesday at noon. 
And last is our newest work group, the Community Care Coordination Team. This group is focusing on access to care and they have just completed their strategic planning process. They've identified their goals, um, which are to identify and improve connectivity with existing community health resources and promote data sharing between partners. This group is led by Dr. Carter uh, and it is the fourth Thursday at 11 a.m. So far uh, this year, they've been engaged 211 uh, to partner in a community resources inventory. So some of you may know that 211 offers great service uh, to connect people with resources in their county. Um, it's a statewide resource, so it's a great place for us to combine forces um, and, and have everything in one place. So we're right now we're exploring how we can uh, make sure that all of the, the resources that are available in 211 are accurate and uh, representative of what's actually available. And then once they take that information, we want to see how we can support building that out um, and, and promote services in areas where there might be gaps. And then next we'll be exploring the community. We've been exploring the community health worker referral process. So how do community health workers uh, who work in the county, what is their workflow process and how can we get them to work um, to coordinate that effort with the 211 so that we know that everyone is focusing on um, an updated resource inventory that is reliable for our residents. So I know that again is a lot of information, but does anyone have any questions about any of the work groups? All right, and I will turn it over to our co-chairs for any closing remarks today. Dr. Levy. Dr. Little, hello. <laughs> hello, <laughs> this was a wonderful meeting. I learned a lot about um, the services um, that we're offering in the county, really focusing on youth, and it's so so exciting, particularly around mental health needs. And one of the things I wasn't able to put in the chat is that I have some additional resources for you guys. I will send it to Kimberly so she can send it out, but there are a few resources federally that have tools and materials, and there's a youth-based campaign website that has a plethora of mental health resources for caregivers and parents or just adults who care as well as youth. And I think that um, just having tools and materials and resources also in also having information is helpful because sometimes we're always wondering what we can do and how we can make things better. So um, there are some resources available out um, in the open source space, but you don't have to pay for it. It's, you know, federally funded and already been created for you. So, you know, I'll make sure Kimberly has that information. And, and I just want to close just to say thank you to uh, Taylor and, and Kimberly uh, and uh, for presenting. And um, I, I think the uh, the topic is very difficult for people to hear. Um, and I and I would encourage everybody just to think about ways that we can work together to to solace and the Department of Health is is on board. If you have an idea, you want to run it by us to see if it's something we can do together. You know, we we want to be a good community partner. And uh, um, so if you think of something that we can support you on, let us know, please. So have a good evening, everybody. <laughs> Kim, you can close the meeting out. Sure, thank you again, everyone for joining. And we did put a closing poll just to get an idea of how you felt about the content today. Again, poll names are not recorded, so please feel free to respond honestly. Um, if anyone does have an interest in presenting either at a future meeting or at any of our work groups, um, you can feel free to reach out um, to me or our uh, coalition email address. And I will put that in the chat right now. It's uh, pghac at co.pg.md.us. And thank you all again and enjoy the rest of your week. Bye, bye. You too, you too. Bye everybody. Take good care everyone. <laughs>